Hello and welcome to the world today. We have in the studio with us George Caravan, Member of Parliament for the Scottish National Party, long-standing uh, socialist, defender of Scottish independence for many, many years, and who has been playing a major role as a public intellectual even when he wasn't in Parliament. Uh, George, welcome. Thank you, and, and thank you for, for calling me a socialist. I think it's a word we have to revive. I agree. <laughs> we seem to be in a critical situation. Nicola Sturgeon, uh, the uh, leader of the SNP, um, has called for a second referendum, which has created panic in Whitehall. They don't know exactly how to deal with it. So there's a mixture of bluster and blackmail taking place at the moment. Why do you think, George, explain our, to our viewers uh, why this question has come up so quickly again, clearly to do with Brexit? It's the result of Brexit. We would put in our manifesto for the elections to the Scottish Parliament last year, May uh, 2016, that if there was a material change in the circumstances between Scotland and England, such as England voting to come out of, of Europe, uh, then that would trigger a second uh, referendum for Scottish independence. So, so we have a clear mandate. And I always like to point out, it's, it's, it's not just the Scottish National Party, um, there are other parties that support independence in Scotland, including the Green Party, and it will be the votes of both the SNP and the Greens that will give a Scottish Parliament call for um, a second Scottish referendum on independence. Whereas the Conservative Party and the Labour Party in Scotland are going to vote against even having a referendum. They can vote against independence, which they will do, but voting e even against having a referendum. How do you this is true, and it's particularly <coughs> sad for the Labour Party. I mean, Labour in Scotland is now down to 15% in the polls. Uh, it's, it's way behind even the, uh, the Tory party in Scotland uh, because most of the left votes have moved away to SNP, Greens and so on. The Tories yes. are des are, have decided to create themselves as, as the British party and they will oppose tooth and nail another referendum. Indeed, they're getting their orders from, from Downing Street because it's now apparent that Theresa May and the Conservatives are frightened of, of fighting on two fronts, as they put it, trying to negotiate a deal to leave the EU and having a referendum and dealing with Scotland. And May knows what she is really frightened of is if there's a Scottish referendum and she loses it on Scottish independence, she would have to resign. To do that right in the middle of the, of the Brexit negotiations would be a disaster for the Tory party. So they're really putting their backs to stopping Scotland having a democratic say, and that's all it is. Um, it's giving Scotland a, a chance to comment across the people on what they think about staying in Europe. So the timing of the referendum is crucial. Would the Tories permit a referendum after Brexit? That's as far as we can work out. That's what they're, they're trying to push us in the direction of, of having the, uh, the independence referendum, if they're forced to concede it, uh, in 2020, 2021, i.e. after the UK has, has exited Europe. The Scottish, what the Scottish Government wants is to hold the referendum in that six-month period between a deal being agreed, if one is, no matter when. But whatever deal is settled on between uh, European Commission and, uh, and the British Government, there's a six-month period uh, where um, it goes back to the, the other 27 members of the EU, and they all get to decide w whether they accept the deal or not, plus the European Parliament gets to vote on it. So w what we will be arguing is, in that six-month period, why shouldn't Scotland have a vote? So the, the referendum on independence is as much about the ind independence as about having a say on whether you're in or out of, of Europe. I think that will play very well in Scotland, whether they're pro-independence pro or not. They'll want a vote on the Brexit deal, and that's what we're trying to offer them. The argument being put forward at the moment in the mainstream media is that given that one third of SNP supporters voted for Brexit, in uh, Scotland, uh, the notion that they would win an independence referendum at the moment is not on, because those who voted for Brexit, uh, why should they vote for an independent Scotland inside the EU? I certainly admit that a proportion of SNP and, and yes voters, yes to independence, uh, voted for Brexit, voted against the, the current state of Europe. 
Um, just how many is still a matter of, of, of debate, but we'll, we'll, we'll accept we'll the see. way. Yeah. But I, I'd, also, I'd also point out that the city in the UK, which voted, voted heaviest to stay in Europe in the June 2016 Brexit referendum, was Glasgow, which is the most working class city in the UK. So it's, it's not quite as simple as saying that, 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 that there's a large number of, 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 of traditional SNP voters wanted, wanted to leave Europe. The SNP the referendum vote uh, on independence is designed to give people a choice. And even those people who are against uh, the present form of Europe, what we'd say to them is, um, well, you're not going to get much of an option if you stay with the UK and get a very hard WTO rules Brexit where Britain is just marooned and, and you know, sailing in the wake of, of, of Trump's America. I think that uh, Scottish independence and Catalan independence, because people of Catalonia are also uh, seeking a, a, an independence referendum, um, if we create some new um, centre-left anti-austerity nations within Europe, we have the best chance of transforming Europe. And I, I think most members of the SNP are critical of the form that the present European Union takes. And the best option to changing it is to create new countries, uh, anti-austerity, uh, support anti-austerity within the European system. So and I think we can do that. I think we can change the balance of forces within Europe. Then there's another question that arises, that Scotland, even if it votes for independence and becomes an independent state, doesn't automatically gain entry into the European Union simply because it was a remnant or part of the United Kingdom. Now, I have heard it argued that this is, in fact, quite an interesting legal issue because when the actual Treaty of Union was signed, it was a treaty between two independent and sovereign states. So that if these two states decide democratically, which one of them wants to do, or according to the polls, that it is separating, it is breaking that Treaty of the Union. I mean, we're into wonderful kind of legal territory here. <laughs> um, one of the reasons we want to hold the independence referendum before the UK exits is precisely because it triggers the whole issue of that Scotland is, is a current member. Scotland would not be leaving. It would be England, and therefore it would be a, a, a better legal defence, if you, if you like, uh, for us to be in continuing membership rather than to come out and try and negotiate back in. But, I mean, uh, these, are, these are legal niceties. The, the, re, the, politics. the real question is, let's assume the Scottish Parliament is going to vote for a second referendum. Is Westminster going to block it completely? Or are they going to offer compromises? Technically and constitutionally, they have the right to block it. Um, Not the right, yeah, but yeah. I mean the legal right. right. Because, because we're, we're in a situation where, where politics dominates, and always remember that, that um, Theresa May and the Tories have a very narrow majority at Westminster. They're deeply split over Brexit. So what they can deliver is not that simple. It depends on them sticking together. I think there's still space to put popular pressure on the government, uh, Westminster government, to force them to accept a Scottish referendum. So we're not, we're not starting with the premise that they're, 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 they're going to deny it. We keep the political pressure, we mobilise people, we mobilise all sections of Scottish society, the trade unions, the churches, to demand this. And I, so I, I still think we will get it. If we get the referendum, we get it within uh, the period when, when UK is still inside Europe. Then the other political dimension is, um, is not the legalisms of are we in, are we out, technically, but can we persuade enough countries in the rest of the EU that they should support Scotland being in? I think we've shifted ground on that a lot in the last year. Since Brexit, we've been going around, I've been to talk to senior um, politicians across Europe. They are now much more responsive to Scotland staying in because Scotland staying in strengthens Europe, the European project. They're desperate to have democratic nations who support Europe. An independent Scotland would, without doubt, encourage huge expectations in Catalonia, which means that the Spanish state, and particularly this government, Rajoy government, would veto or could veto Scottish remaining or re-entering or whatever the EU for fear that if they get away with it, how can I stop the Catalans? The Scottish government 
quite rightly, doesn't interfere in decisions made in other oh, countries. So it, does, so it's not, it do, does not have a, a view on what happens within Spain or in Catalonia. But as a, a, a socialist and as a, 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 a devout believer in, in, in democracy in Europe, what I would say is that, that Spain and Madrid should proceed through dialogue. And the, the, the example we have in Scotland in our 2014 referendum was that the London government and the Scottish government agreed that there should be a, a referendum and it, the, the decision was with the people. Something over 400 elected officials in Catalonian government level and at, at uh, municipal level are under indictment from the, um, the Constitutional oh, yeah. Court in Spain for trying to facilitate, to, even to talk about a referendum right. on Catalan independence. Yeah. I think in Europe that's not the way we should go. I think let's, let's have dialogue. Now, would the Madrid government block um, Scottish membership of, of the EU simply as some kind of uh, deterrent to the Catalans. All I can do is appeal to, to, to the people in Madrid that that, that that doesn't help Europe and it certainly doesn't help them with a dialogue in, in, in Catalonia. We should keep the two, the two issues separate. If the Scottish government is saying it is not interfering in the democratic processes in Catalonia, then equally Spain should not be exporting its domestic politics into the rest of the EU and interfering with what's happening in Scotland. I think you might have not just to appeal to Madrid, but also to Washington and Berlin, which will be decisive factors in determining what Madrid does. Uh, I, th I think the future, the future lies with, with Germany and what the outcome of the German elections. Germany is the one country in, in Europe where there's been a massive upswing on, on, on the le social democratic left. So we'll be yeah. interested to see what no, happens no. in Germany. And that's related partially to the German economy and the fact that they didn't deindustrialize like uh, many other parts of Europe. But we're avoiding a, another thorny election coming up, which is France, where the situation, as you know, is extremely serious. The French commentators are now saying in the French press that Marine Le Pen could be the next president of France. If this happens, all bets are off, George in my opinion. This will have a huge impact. This isn't any old country. This is a founder of the European Union together with the Germans. I mean, the Germans will panic uh, if this happens, but not just them. So it's, it's a, the situation is in flux unless we, until the French elections are over. The European Union that we, we knew is uh, is, it, it is in structural crisis. Uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, I, I think one of the dominant ones is that the, the, the way that the euro was imposed on Europe and then led to the, the imposition of, of austerity across the whole southern belt of the EU has alienated huge numbers of people uh, from the existing system. Now, uh, my solution, I think the, the, the solution of people in, in, in the SNP and the left in Scotland, is not to walk away from Europe because the alternative of walking away from Europe is some kind of, you can see it in the Tories, it's some kind of fantasy land of the 18th century of Britannia sailing the waves alone. What we need to do is to have a strategy for rebuilding a, a people's Europe. The, the debate in Scotland, therefore, is not about you know, Scotland getting independence to join or stay in the existing European structures. It's to try and create an opening where we can discuss how to reform Europe. And I think that I think that's best done. I mean, in, 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 from my point, in actually in actually getting independence and getting into the EU and debating. And I think if we if we can create more of an alliance of the smaller um, centre-left um, governments in, in the EU, then we have a, we have a prospect of changing things. Yeah, the thing is this: that within the German elite now there is considerable discussion going on. Depending on the French election, uh, we'll see how fast they act. But I know this for a fact, that they are discussing in Germany, privately and behind the scenes, that if we lose France and the French, I mean, Le Pen is committed not to withdrawing from the EU, that's a big difference, uh, but to uh, dumping the euro. Well, that's it, if they decide to do even that. A majority in France is for dumping the euro, not the EU. <clears throat> so if that happens, the Germans will have to rethink hell of a lot, George. Cause, uh, and what the talk is now is a two-tier Europe. More and more they're discussing the central core of Europe where the German sovereignty is paramount, really. They decide what happened. And the rest, which are sort of little statelets which they can uh, work with. But it's that debate 
if France goes, is going to dominate more and more? I think it emerges, whatever happens in France, I, I'm, I'm slightly more optimistic. In yeah, no, no. But, I'm... but what, I mean, what, what's going to happen is I mean, the, the euro is essentially the Deutschmark writ large, and it was designed to secure the supply chain for, for uh, German manufacturing, because the supply chain is no longer simply in, in Germany itself. It's, it's, it's into the Czech Republic, it's into Poland, points out. The risk they took when they, when they created the euro was to expand into other, other parts of the EU, which they shouldn't have done. Uh, fixed exchange rate, because when you, when, you, when you come into the euro, you have to lock in your exchange yeah. rate. And a whole swathe of countries went in at the long, wrong exchange rate. So I can see a situation in the medium term, maybe even the short term, where the eurozone breaks up and effectively goes back to being simply um, a, a German currency, so-called the euro, but, but locking in those countries that are, um, are intimately uh, connected to German Economic. industrial supply chain. Uh, France is the odd one out because it's such, it's such a big country, but it's not within that orbit. From the, the, the Mediterranean countries, it makes much greater sense for them to go back to having their own country, their own currencies where they could, they could get a bit of flexibility. Which, of course, raises the issue about if Scotland within, within, within the, the, the European zone, would it have its own currency? There's a lively debate now emerging in, in, in the, in the uh, period up to the Scottish referendum. Uh, on that very, very issue. Europe is changing. All we're, all we're saying is, is that, 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 the, that, that, that very probably uh, there'll have to be some major reconstruction of, of the euro. Would that, would that mean the end of Europe? Uh, no, no, I, I don't, don't think, think so. so. But I think it'll create a completely different situation where left social democrats, socialists, people on the left will have to come up with something yes. new to fight for, which yeah. means a new constitution as well, you know, to struggle for, for something different. But, but we'll that's see. the weakness at the moment because the, 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 the center left and the social democratic left, they leftwards, they're, they're not meeting, they're not discussing, no, they're no, not they producing have... something new. So that's a big political vacuum, yes. Well, it is, and they're paying the price for it too. But George, before we get off this question, we've discussed the Tories and the SNP. There's Labour, which is in a bad way in Scotland, but let's say there's a vote, which there will be in the House of Commons to permit a new referendum in Scotland. How do you think the Labour Party will divide? Because we hear we have a very strange uh, combination that probably there is no big division within the Labour Party. There is on everything else now with Corbyn in power, but in terms of preserving the union, they seem to be pretty much uh, uh, united. So one assumes that the Labour Party as a whole will vote against a referendum, make some excuse for, for, for doing so at the present time, and link up with those Tories who are opposed to it as well. Well, if, if, if Labour at a UK level took the decision to oppose having a referendum and then in the referendum actually blocking with the Tories who are now the, the, the main opposition in Scotland. I think that would be the, the, the very end of, of what's left of the Labour Party in Scotland. I'm, I'm not so sure what, what Labour thinking is at leadership level in, in England or, or, or uh, in terms of, of, of the Corbyn I mean Corbyn's team. first I, response was if they want a referendum let them his, have it. His instant response when, when, a, when a reporter put that to him, should there be a referendum, he said, let them have it. Um, and I think that's his genuine view. Now, there was then, you know, um, screaming from, from, uh, from, the, from, the, from what's left of Scottish Labour uh, uh, up north. Uh, and um, uh, the, the, the phrase was that he'd, he'd, he reaffirmed the existing view and, he'd, you know, he'd misspoken. Certain Labour people I talked to in England and London they know that Scott, they've lost, they've lost it in Scotland. They'll never, they'll never, they'll never win back their position. They may not come out and say, "Well, we've abandoned Scotland." I think it'd be difficult for them to say no, that. No, they can't. But you know, there's not going to be, in my view, a major push from Labour, from the Corbyn team and Labour down here, if there's a referendum. They'll accept the result, whatever it is. They'll, they'll let, let Scotland get on with it. But there are only sort of 15 or maximum 20 supporters of Corbyn in the Parliamentary Labour Party, George. And it shows, and it shows. I mean, I, when I go into Parliament every week and you see uh, the Corbyn team, you know, out of debates and when, when Jeremy gets up in, in, in Parliament, and most of his backbenchers just sit there with their arms folded, and then they will get up and criticize him. I mean, it is, it's, it's, it's embarrassing. It's a, a party that's deeply divided. And the electorate know that, they know that in Scotland. 
George, let's leave all this aside for the moment. How do you explain the fact that after the 2008 crisis, when there clearly any sane, rational, capitalist government would have decided that perhaps this is the time to let them have a tiny bit of social democracy, but they were hardline against it. Both the center parties, which I call the extreme center, and the parties. So we have a situation now where different movements in Europe are opposing it, both from the left and the right. De Linke in Germany, I mean, the report I got of Marine Le Pen's speech or television debate, she was very hard for a, how to put it, uh, a social democratic type settlement on renationalizing, stopping the privatizations, giving France back. It you know, could be a load of baloney and probably is. But the fact that she is saying this is she knows that there is a vacuum in there. And the total failure of social democratic governments in Europe to do this has just sort of imploded them. Well, that, that's what happened to, to Labour in the UK. Labour actually, yeah. at the, the 2015 election, um, was brazen that they and they thought they, they would win votes from the middle class by saying we embrace austerity we will be the party that puts a cap on on welfare spending i went in i i, I was in parliament when labor voted for a cap on welfare spending there were a tiny number of labor rebels with the snp in in, in the lobby and the, but most of the labor party were with the tories in Scotland, I feel very proud. The, 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 what, we, what we proved is that if a social democratic party stood out and said, we oppose austerity, um, within, the, within all the difficulties of a, of, of a global economic crisis, we will ever endeavor to protect the poor as best we can. Um, we won that argument on the doorsteps. And we, we have been in government for, for 10 years. Now, it's been difficult. We've actually had 10 billion pounds worth of our income taken away as a result of, 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 of the government of Westminster um, cutting subventions to Scotland. But we, we, we had enough control of our budget to protect the poor. Uh, and people responded to that. And we give them an alternative. We did the same on, on um, immigration. Um, where the social democratic parties have caved into the idea of, of having immigration controls. I remember, I mean, in, in, uh, in election, a student, the 2010 general election, I knocked on 17,000 doors by myself over, over, over a period of time. And you'd meet people on the door who'd say, oh, immigrants, we, 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 we must stop immigration because it's harming our jobs. And you just say to people, no, and you take them through the arguments and you win them over. And Labour failed to do that on austerity, it failed to do that on immigration, and it suffered. And now as we, you have a vacuum, as you say, and the danger is the vacuum gets, gets filled by populist right-wing forces who claim that they can they be anti-austerity, but in truth, when they get there, no, it they'll isn't do what true. the banks tell them. Um, but the last question is the following, which is raised by everyone and could have an impact in a ref in the new Scottish referendum if it takes place which is that given the economic crisis, uh, given that you want to stay in the EU, which is very harsh on small countries, how can Scotland maintain itself as a viable independent state? Well, I mean, even if you take oil away, we're still yeah. in the top 20 uh, um, richest nations by, by GDP per head. So, I mean, we, I mean we, we've got a... We've got a, we're quite a sophisticated economy. At least we're, we're, we're like Scandinavian. We're like, like Norway or, or, or Sweden or Denmark. We're that scale of economy. So it's, per, it's perfectly possible for us, us, to, us, us to survive in that sense. Um, uh, of course, the danger is we're now moving into a world where um, there's going to be um, uh, countries, trade, free trade as we knew it, was something imposed by America and imposed by the American banks so they can move capital out. That's gone now. We, we could be in the next 20, 30 years uh, and a situation analogous to the 30s where global trade starts to break down, you have protection going up. In that sense, the best solution is for small countries, particularly small countries with a left, you know, with a, with a, with a, with a culture and, and a society that's left of center. The best thing for them to do is to take control of their own economic levers. There's no guarantee. And collaborate anything. with each. Yeah, there's no guarantee you can you you know in, in in this dangerous world you know what happens. But the best solution could take control yourself at a popular level. 
why, how, how seriously has the SNP considered the idea of collaboration, but serious collaboration with the Nordic countries, especially Norway, which is probably closer to you than uh, quite a lot of continental European countries? Uh, it, it's, it's, been a, it's been a long discussion within, within the Scottish National Party that, that, that our, 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 our natural hinterland is, is actually the Nordic countries. Exactly. Very close, very close links, very similar societies. Um, uh, and I think that's what, we'll, that's what will happen. We've lots to learn about how they, they preserve a local democracy. Um, lots of trainings, and also in geopolitical terms, I mean, in, in, in terms of defence structures and security, yes. we're, much, we're much closer to, to Norway, Sweden, um, uh, Iceland out on the other side of the Atlantic. Exactly. So I, I, I think that's our natural strategic hinterland, yes. And you think this will be taken up seriously by an uh, independent Scotland? Oh, over the last 10, 15 years, there's been the links, have been, organic links, uh, you know, uh, people go across, there's links between uh, MPs in Parliament. So the, the, the structure is beginning to be there, yes. George, about yourself, you know, I've known you a long time, in good times and bad. Your shift from Labour, uh, being a sort of leader of Labour in Edinburgh, to the SNP was not a lonely move. <laughs> How many of the old yes, socialists yes. in the oh, Labour oh, Party? Oh, oh, the, 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 the Labour Party, the, 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 the general left of the Labour Party, of my generation, uh, I'm, 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 a, I'm a 60s, you know, I, I brought up the radical 60s. Uh, uh, and what how, the, those of us that went through the, the, the youth radicalisation of the 60s ended up with the Labour Party because it, it, it was the institution you had to work through. Um, and, but we, when, when Tony Blair came along and Gordon Brown, most of us, all of my generation, um, moved, you know, slowly but surely into the SNP. So, if you like, in one sense, the, the Scottish National Party is, 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 is the kind of centre-left Labour Party that was in the 60s and 70s. This would have made lots of SNP people, uh, SNP intellectuals, some of whom are no longer with us, who died very happy, because this is the party they were wanting and arguing for for a long, long time. Um, would you say that we are now seeing, since the SNP victory, the emergence of something we could call a Scottish intelligentsia again? Because <laughs> um, a lot of the intellectuals there, George, still seem to be very unionist. I mean, Colin Kidd, John Curtis, all these people. But I know there is an, another layer. There, 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 was a, there was a period when... when the, the, Scottish intellect. I mean, Scotland's very like Europe. It's not, it's not, English intellectual is much more empirical. Oxbridge, really a bit divorced from politics, but, but the intellectuals in Scotland were always very politically committed. Uh, and we're either part of Labour or part of the Communist Party, because we also have a very large Communist Party in Scotland. Um, uh, in many ways, the, 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 the intellectuals were, were a bit conflicted um, uh, because they, they'd bought in so heavily to. Um, a, a social democracy that needed the size of the UK to deliver, to control the, the, the big companies, to control the banks. Um, but all, when all that evaporated, um, there, there was a split. And actually, in many ways, it was the intellectuals who led the left into the SNP. Um, when we had, a, we had an early referendum in, in, in Scotland on, on, on creating a home rule parliament um, back in 1979, uh, actually, we got a majority for that, um, but then Westminster overruled that and refused to accept it. Mrs. Thatcher came along, so we didn't get um, a devolved parliament at that time. And in huge numbers, the intellectuals broke away from Labour at that point and tried to start imagining what a new Scotland would look like. Uh, and it was on the back of that intellectual shift, actually, that the, the, the politicians came along from Labour and moved into to the SNP. So, and we still cherish our intellectuals and our, our, our writers and our, our television makers uh, in Scotland. Uh, and I think you'd find if you went there, you'd discover actually the vast bulk of the, of the, of, of the, of the intelligentsia uh, are, are pro-independence. Maybe not pro-SNP, but certainly pro-independence. George, it's been great talking. Thanks very Thank much. You.